All right, today it's my uh, honor to meet with Mike Bush. Uh, you may have uh, heard the name. You can see over his shoulder, he's got a football jersey there from Wazoo. Uh, he was an all Pac-10 receiver. Um, one season he had 10 rece uh, touchdown receptions. Uh, in his career, he had almost 100 receptions and over 1,600 yards. Uh, and the interesting thing is he was also an all Pac-10 basketball player. Uh, uh, finished in their top four all time in, in steals. Um, and to, to be able to be an athlete that can excel at that high a level in both, and then had an opportunity to go on and, and uh, continue after college for a little while in both as well. So, um, but there's a lot more uh, to Mike than, than his athletic prowess. And uh, um, so Mike, I'd like to hear what your background is um, personally. And if you need to go back and talk about parents and grandparents and and, and then a specifically how race has played a role in your background. Whew, well, uh, first I'd like to say thank you. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity. I was a little hesitant on um, really getting back to you and being a part of this. Uh, one, because I'm, 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 pretty, I'm pretty closed off. I don't share a lot of my, my story and my background, um, you know, even with my wife, which is pretty strange. Um, love her to death, but I, I'm really guarded when it comes to things, you know, that I've went through in my life. Uh, one, to try, try to not to use it as a crutch. And two, just because I, I, I just feel like I, I leave the past in the past. And I've, uh, as you'll see when I talk about kind of my life story, how um, I, I've just tried to transition to the next phase. Um, and that's how I'm going to kind of break down my, my history and the things that uh, I've went through. Uh, it's through phases. Uh, Phase one, uh, grew up in Riverside, California. Um, great family, uh, mom, dad, older brother. Um, and I mean, through, through these experiences, uh, as we go through these phases, so let me take a step back. Um, it's gonna show kind of how I've, I've lived whew, probably 10 people's lives. I mean, I've seen so many different um, demographics and social economic and all those types of things I've lived a part of each one of them uh, which is why I feel like I can relate to a lot of our kids and um, you know that's been a, a bonus for me obviously coaching but also helping in our community um, so growing up in Riverside California um, my family actually was a black owned uh, on the racetrack Adams Kart track in uh, California. Uh, my great grandparents opened that in 1958 or nine. Um, and it's still going today. Uh, a couple of my cousins, my aunts, my uncles have owned it at one point. My grandma owned it at one point, And it's just passed through our generation to generation. Mm -hmm. Grandma, uh, Grandma Helen, uh, she had, I think 13 siblings. Mm -hmm. So uh, in all in Southern California, so we have a ton of family down there in Southern California. And it, it was really the modern family, um, you know, nice house, uh, brother, brother um, aunts and uncles, cousins, everybody running around. Every second and fourth Sunday of the month, we would go down to the racetrack. All of our family members would be there. Uh, families would race and, and do stuff and compete versus other people in the community and people coming from Northern California. Um, and that, that kind of, led up to about 14 years old and um i used to race brother raced uh and and up until we were about 14 and 14 is when my brother left to go to school so uh he was a basketball player played for eisenhower high school uh, who was actually one of the number one football teams in the state back then so we used to take trips to college basketball games where my cousins would play high school games where we would watch my brother play who uh, broke records at uh, eisenhower high school and then went on to play at Seattle University um, and, and had a great career there also and had some opportunities after that. Uh, when he was leaving, um, and, and you know, I don't know if I, I created this scenario in my, in my mind, but um, it was like my parents said, well, he's gone, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna take a break. And my parents got a divorce. Mm. And, um, to me, it felt like they were, okay that they had made it that far and you know i was me i'm five years younger um he had left and then it was just me and me and my brother have some difficulties at times because he lived that perfect life 
he lived that life that you hear everybody dreamed of, you know, through parents, family. And uh, from age 14 on, I didn't live that life. Uh, you know, I, I went from, you know, phase two, I went from living in apartments, living in, living with my uncles, living with my aunt, my aunt Connie, living with my granddad, um, living in the car, living in a hotel, um, all in the span of two years. It just like, and, and it kind of pushed me away from family um, because I, I, I look back and I, and I felt like family should have been there. And I don't know if it, they were there. To, I mean, looking back at it, they were there. But in my mind and what was going on in my family and my immediate family, I, I felt like I needed to find something else, mm -hmm. and which led me down some different paths and, and run-ins with police and things like that of that sort. Uh, nothing criminal, just mischief and, and not going to school. Um, I can tell you probably my freshman and sophomore year, I went to Rubido High School. I probably attended 10 days hmm. uh, full, mm -hmm. but uh, during basketball season, I was eligible. Hmm. Uh, not a knock on them. Uh, just, just was the life. It was, it was what I did. I hung out with older group. Uh, we did plenty of things that I'm not proud of. Uh, we did some things I am proud of. Um, but, you know, that, that's kind of phase two, and it was, it was a grind. Hmm. It was a grind. I mean, I had all kinds of older cousins and stuff like that that were just amazing that I just kind of separated myself to. Uh, I actually uh, was playing sports at the time, which to me, sports has been a vehicle for everything I've done in life. Um, played football and basketball, uh, like you mentioned, but in high school, I was uh, one of the top 100 basketball players in the country. Um, and uh, there was a coach, AAU coach by the name of Elbert Perry. And we used to call him Kool-Aid. Everybody called him Kool-Aid. He was pretty famous. Sonny Vaccaro, who was head of Adidas at the time, um, you know, took his team on. And uh, they actually sent us, it was like two or three of us, away to camp, uh, which was in Teaneck, New Jersey. It was called ABCD Camp at the time. Not sure if it's still going on, uh, where I got to play against Kobe Bryant, you know, all those guys, Tracy McGrady, Stephon Mulberry, um, all those types of players. And and, and it, I only bring that up, not to toot my horn that I played at that level, but to, to, that was my opportunity to get away. And I, I kind of threw myself into basketball and just on the court, I was all the frustrations, all the pent up anger, I was able to release it. And without basketball, I'm not sure I wouldn't be dead or in jail with, with the direction I was going um, because I was able to release some of that anger on the court. Um, sometimes uh, with a technical or a foul or something of that matter. But uh, so I went away to Teaneck, New Jersey to a camp, and that's where I met uh, Tony Tucker, uh, who I think uh, helped start IMG Academy. Uh, he's now uh, head of uh, uh, prep school in Ohio, I believe. Well, he um, afforded me an opportunity to leave Southern California. And it was tough for me to leave, even though I knew uh, where I was headed. Um, but I packed up and left as a 15-year-old. Went to boarding school. Um, I just recently have gotten reconnected with boarding school. Uh, boarding school as was called Mercersburg Academy. Um, and it, uh, to give you a little bit of insight, it cost $62,000 a year to go to Mercersburg Academy. Mm. So um, to tell you that that was a shock in a in a cult, and, and when I was in that time, you didn't think I didn't think about oh this is sixty two thousand or this is forty thousand at that time. Uh, you don't think about those things. I I I learned to adapt in any situation. Um, so I threw myself into it. I actually went with another player, Mike Simmons, uh, one of my my good buddies growing up. So we both went to Mercersburg Academy. There were ten African Americans. In Mercersburg Academy, uh, my roommate, and this is phase three, my roommate spoke five different languages. His dad was a doctor in Africa. Uh, our rival high school, Chelsea Clinton, went to so playing games on their campus with secret, secret service and all of them surrounding the court and doing things to be able to keep her protected. Um, you know, and in this life, 
phase three life, I, I feel like <coughs> opened my eyes to a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Because growing up phase one in, in just this American family, great, black, own a business, going, and you only really, you're really sheltered. I could, to this day, see my cousin bring in a white, his white girlfriend to the racetrack, and you just, it, it was off. You felt like it was off, but everybody loved her. I think her name was April. And this is like, I, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, maybe. Um, and you, and it just, you never, there were white racers there. There were guys that multimillionaires that raced at the racetrack and you never really saw color. And I really, really saw it until he brought his white girlfriend to the track and nobody treated her any different. I, I'm sure some of our, her, uh, Aunts were a little like, <laughs> sure you want to do that. But I mean, he, he's one of my favorite cousins and to this day, and he actually runs the racetrack now. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that was my first like, mm, that might not be, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So go, fast forward to phase three, you know, seeing the side where you're, you're living with guys who you don't feel struggle. And I, and I think that's part of the problem in the world today is, is you know your side and you know your battles, but not everybody has been able to be at every side of it. I, I was in a side my first 14 years. So I didn't, we didn't struggle. Mm -hmm. and we, just, we just didn't struggle. And if we were struggling, our parents didn't let us know as kids. They, they found a way and they did things. But we had our own beds. We had our own rooms. We built additions onto the house. We, I mean, we had it all from what I felt like we had it all. Mm -hmm. Phase two, I had nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I could see that side. And that's two years living, living in places where there's five kids, kids laying on top of you, you living in the car. I mean, going from place to place. I can't imagine if I had to do that for 18 years. And I, and I kind of have a part of that is still in me. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's two parts. And then moving and going to Mercersburg Academy where, whew, like everything is everything. I didn't, I didn't come home for Thanksgiving. I actually took a trip um, with one of uh, my basketball players uh, on my team and we went to North Carolina and we went and I went to UNC, went to Duke, went to a couple different schools in the area since they're so close. And then we pull up to his house. And I, if I tell you his door of his front of his house was literally probably bigger than my house. Wow. I mean, it was, it was huge. And then, and you, you can't, you kind of, okay, yeah, okay, it's a big house. During that time, I was just, you know, this is my buddy. This is what we're doing. We're going. They've taken me in for Thanksgiving. We got basketball games uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. But this family was amazing. So at Mercersburg Academy, you know, there was an underlining sense of racism. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, while I was going through it, uh, my my one of my buddies that went with me, Mike Simmons, he was really militant. Like he was really like, we're, we're it's 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 black or nothing. Mm -hmm. um, which I think he's transitioned. I mean, which anybody being in that situation, you know, it's just where we came from and what what his demographics were and how he grew up in his little area. But you know, I I, I remember times where teachers would point me out and and really, you know put it to me because obviously I was there on scholarship, couldn't afford to go there and uh, was African American. And there wasn't a lot of people there that looked like me. Mm -hmm. um, but there was one teacher that really took me in and was like, Hey, I'm going to help you. Um, obviously two years at uh, Rubido high school, never went to school. Mm -hmm. So really from junior high to sophomore year, junior year, which when I went to Mercersburg Academy, I repeated, my sophomore year. Um, so now I'm in my second sophomore year. And this co teacher took me in. His name was Rick Henderson. He's my football coach. He's a wrestling coach, English teacher. He kind of took me in. And by the way, we lived on campus boarding. So he took me in and kind of just kind of integrated me and started teaching me different things that I really fully didn't understand academically um, and really helped me pursue maybe going to college. You know, I never, I saw my cousins in college. I saw my brother go away to college, 
But after about 14, I, I, there was there was no thought to me ever going to school past high school, if even going to high school. It just wasn't something that was on my radar. Um, and, you know, even kids today, like, they have a, a 1.0, and they're like, I'm going to college. And, you know, mm-hmm. like, yeah. <laughs> you, need, you need to do something a little better, buddy. You know, mm-hmm. I'm going to get a scholarship to LSU. And, and it's mm-hmm. like, oh, well, you haven't even played high school football. You're a senior and you – so that that was kind of me. And and for those kids, I can relate to mm-hmm. because it was – once we got there, it was like, okay. And he kind of opened my eyes to a, a lot of things in life. And, 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 and there's these men that have come into my life that have really kind of pushed me to the next page. Mm-hmm. Um, so boarding school was awesome went there for two years but I just growing up for my first 14 years having family and and this sense of bond with all of my family members I, I felt like I needed to be there I needed to be somewhere where I had family and someone that I knew that was just it that we were just together and it was mm-hmm. us mm-hmm. um and so I left there um needing I think eight courses or something like that. And I left there after my junior year, going to my senior year. If I would have stayed there, I wouldn't have been able to go to college because they only gave certain uh, classes. Mm. I transferred to Washington, Mm. Kent, Washington, Mm. um, where my brother had just graduated from Seattle University, uh, was getting married, had a kid, um, and he took me in. And he was, uh, I mean, he was great. He, he became kind of that, that older brother, father figure, which he was when I was younger at 14. And I used to follow him around and him teach me how to play basketball and all those things um, since he was five years older than me. And I, I lived with him at Kent Meridian. Um, I came to Kent Meridian and um, I actually had uh, correspondence with about, I would say over a hundred colleges uh, mm-hmm. to play sports and to play basketball. Um, after leaving boarding school and playing at ABCD camp. So like getting letters and e- emails or it wasn't emails back then, but you know, letters in the mail and stuff like that from all kinds of school. My mom still has booklets upon booklets of letters from colleges. Um, once they saw my transcript <laughs> and saw that I was deficient in everything, uh, which I was on my way back and I was on a good track, uh, all of them backed away. There was one school that didn't back away. And that was WSU. And Jeff Mayer was the assistant coach at the time. Kevin Eastman, who won a a championship with uh, Boston Celtics and Doc Rivers, and then was a player personnel guy with the Clippers for a while. Amazing guy. Um, But Jeff Mayer was kind of the guy who helped me transition my senior year into college. And he stuck with me. I mean, nobody thought it was possible to get my grade point average to a Mm 2.0. No one thought it was possible to get my SAT to be over 1,000 in order to the sliding scale to be eligible. But he literally would drive over um, during the week and meet with my counselors at Kent Meridian. He would would almost take me to class, but I was going to class (laughs) anyway at that time. Um, So... He, he just stayed on me and he was, he was kind of that next presence in my life and, and helped me transition. Um, to say things from that point got easier, whew, it would be crazy because they, it, it, they didn't. They didn't get easier, but you know, it just was that next step. I, I had dug a hole and it was grinding to get it out. I played five games of football for Rick, um, Bruce Rick, at KM, and then was deemed ineligible. Um, I was deemed ineligible because I had repeated that sophomore season. Mm. I was in my fifth year, and I needed to go through the WIAA, uh, which I know a ton about now, but back then, nobody told me. I, I would have thought my counselors, my principal, the athletic director at the time would have told me. They didn't tell me. Um, part of the reason I was suspended, which I look at, is because, I mean, I played – four or five games and I had 10 to 15 touchdowns mm-hmm. um, and you know it, it if I wouldn't have did anything I'm sure I would have still been eligible mm-hmm. um, but you know that, that it is what it is I, I decided okay I'll adapt and I'll move forward and I'll figure something else out and I ended up playing rugby mm-hmm. that's when I met Rex Norris who was the head football coach at Kentwood 
um, even during that time. Um, so meeting Rex Norris, and obviously I'm the head coach now at Kentwood. Uh, it was a great experience. I played rugby, probably my favorite sport. Um, and I was 6'6", 170 pounds. Um, but, you know, just that, that type of grind and, and physicality, I just, I, I love it. I, I play basketball that way. Um, as you said, I was fourth in the steals. I mean, I'm just in your face. Go get it. Let's go. Let's get after it. Don't matter where we're at. Play on the blacktop. You know, and that, that kind of transitioned me out of high school. Hmm. Um, was playing rugby, and that was the only sport I really played in high school. Still had a scholarship at Washington State. Passed the SAT, which Jeff Mayer took me to, which probably was a violation. <laughs> um, dropped me off at the front door to make sure I went in. Because the first one, I, I kind of blew off. I, I was just nervous, you know, mm -hmm. nervous about taking it. Didn't think I was ready. Um, but little did I know, uh, going back to Mercersburg, they, they really – the academics at that type of place where you're paying $62,000 a year prepares you for a lot when it comes to academics. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes, it makes life easy mm -hmm. uh, when it comes from the after the academic world. So I was prepared. I passed. Um, now it becomes okay. Everybody wants me in college, all the coaches, but does the Dean want me in college? Mm -hmm. Um, Went over my parents. Uh, I think I think at this time my mom came up, which is an amazing lady, um, and uh, my brother and his wife took me over to Wazoo. Went over to Jeff Mayer's house. I was there with four or five other basketball recruits. They were all moving into the dorm. I hadn't been accepted yet because of my GPA and my SAT. So um, you know I. I, I my parents leave, my mom leaves, my brother and them drive back. I'm living in uh, Jeff Mayer's house, which is probably another violation. Um, and he's, he's passed away since then. Uh, but I'm living in his house and he is talking to administration. Um, and I basically, I have to go in front of the president of the university to let them know why I deserve to be in school. Mm -hmm. I, I should be afforded these opportunities to, to pursue um, athletic and academic success at the university. So I go in front of them and, um, you know, like I said, Mercersburg Academy, again, falling back on that. They, they prepared me to be able to have that conversation and to show. And that was really the first time where I kind of opened up a little bit about my past. Um, and probably haven't opened up since then, but, uh, and just let them know and understand that, you know, I, I went through some things, obviously not as bad as some people and not as great as others, but, you know, and, and they let me into school. Mm -hmm. and, um, obviously through that, uh, it was a different experience and a different type of lifestyle. And then leaving there, going to Europe and being in Europe for a year and a half, um, was another dynamic and another lifestyle where, you know, it just, you know, those, those different phases in my life have just opened me up to have a different view of a lot of things that are going on in the world that I don't think some people fully accept from the African American community and from the other side and other nationalities where they, they, they kind of, of are passing each other in their thoughts. Mm -hmm. Some are really trying to help. Some are not trying to help. And, and it just, I feel like I have a unique sense and view of things that are going on. Obviously, uh, nobody's right, to be honest. I mean, and when you look at things, nobody's right because everybody lives their own truths. Mm -hmm. Whether or not we're trying to bridge that gap and push things a little closer, um, yes, I mean, that that's... I mean, through my life, I've seen obviously both sides, and I've seen where the academics part lets a person down um, in Southern California, where you know you go to this school and there's there's I mean there's no way to fail. Mm -hmm. you literally, live on the floor where your teacher's at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, so you're walking down the hallway and they're like, "Hey, man, did you do your English?" 
You know what I mean? Did you, you got this tomorrow and where you're at another institution where it's like, hey, man, you you going to win the game tonight? You know, it's, a, it's just a different conversation. And it's not all inner city schools that are like that. And I didn't live really in the inner city, but Riverside, uh, California, um, it's just a totally different dynamic. And it's what, you know, they mean well. They mean well, but they're trying to relate to you on what you find important. Right. And when you when you only are narrow-minded as a student with sports is what I find important, that's the only place where they can meet you. Your only hope is that they drag you towards something that is going to be a little bit more structural in academics and in taking care of your business and being on time and things like that. And those are the types of things that we try to do at Kentwood um, is, and that's why one of our uh, monikers is developed here. We, we, we understand everybody's going to be in all different places, but our goal is to develop them where they're at and develop them within Kentwood and push them to, to success after Kentwood. I would tell you, you know, when I first went into Kentwood, I would have thought I was a player's coach. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of my players dislike me during football and during school because I, I'm, I'm up their butt. Mm -hmm. I understood and I understand what I needed when I was that age and probably to a default because there's times when I probably don't need to be all up there, but I'm in their butt anyway. Mm -hmm. And then leaving high school, you, there's a majority of them reach back out and a majority of them say, man, I needed that. I mean, some of the ones that I was on the toughest are the ones that I'm closest with past, after. Um, just because it's, it's, it's those things that they needed in order to be successful. And my goal is to meet them where they are. So if it's a pat on the butt, it's a pat on the butt, which I've learned three years removed from my first year at Kentwood. Sometimes some kids need fairy dust. Yeah. They yeah. need to be sprinkled. So yeah. that's kind of my journey. Yeah. Um, you know, at, at one point I thought about writing a book. I, I got a, a million stories um, throughout my childhood through college. Um, obviously, some sports related, some just street related, and some Mercersburg Academy related, where some of those kids go through more than I went through as an African American growing up. Some of the rich white kids i mean in the infirmary in, in the infirmary um for doing hardcore drugs at 15 16 years old uh getting expelled from four or five schools and everybody says oh they're just acting out they don't have any you know they don't have no reason to be and and they do so i mean they, they have a they have a story they have a, a a thing that they have to fight through and they have to grind through that weighs them down just like I have a story and I have something that I need to fight through. But we all have stuff that we have to fight through. Mm -hmm. For some people, it maybe it's a little tougher. And I, I can't say for all people of one color, it's tougher. And I can't say for all people of one color, it's, it's easier. Right. They just have different, they have different struggles. Yeah. You know? So, so let me, um, so phase one is kind of, everything's great, right? Families together, everybody's happy. Uh, phase two, and it just happened like overnight, basically, right? Yes. Your world's turned upside down, and um, now you're in a home where you don't even know if family's got your back. And you, looking back now, you know they did, but you didn't feel it, right? And and Not perception exactly. perception's reality at that time. It, it definitely is, right? And then you know you get to go on to the academy, and and expectations and things are high, and you have opportunities. Um, and uh, it prepared you for things, and then, and then you come back and, and live with your brother. And, and um, so one, one constant was, you know, athletics was an avenue for you, yeah. um, which is a huge blessing. Yet at the same time, can you touch on, uh, you know, going back to the high school in California, like, hey, you're going to win tonight. Um, yeah. What level have you experienced um, having to – you know, show that you are more than an athlete because sometimes people just say, well, black man, they're good at sports or they're whatever. Right. And um, maybe touch on that aspect. So uh, going back to, to Southern California, and I know it, it sounds like, you know, that was just a terrible school. 
I think I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to have those conversations about academics, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so if I didn't have basketball, if they didn't relate to me in basketball, like I, I would, I would, I would definitely be in jail or somewhere. And there's a lot of kids that don't. Mm -hmm. So I, I've always related with being an athlete up until I decided I didn't want to be. Mm -hmm. And then you still are. Mm -hmm. That is still who you are. I mean, when I went to Kent Meridian and, and some of my friends tease me to this day, we're in English class and they're like, okay, explain yourself because I'm so guarded. So the obvious, I give the obvious. Mm -hmm. But they're like, explain yourself. Who are you? And I just said, Mike Bush, basketball and football. Mm -hmm. That was my response. Mike Bush, basketball and football. Mm -hmm. Period. I, I, I just so guarded with so many things that are within me and, and who I am and who I actually am. But, you know, you always looked at that in different realms and different places. Uh, you know, that's who you're looked at. And at Mercersburg Academy and in California, that was one in California that kept me out of jail. Mm -hmm. uh, it kept me off the streets as much. At lunchtime, I'd be in there playing basketball while people would be out rioting and shooting. I mean, we had riots at our school. We had shootings at our school. Um, I actually had a, a close friend when I went away to boarding school who was sleeping in her car and police officers pulled up beside her and uh, she got startled and they bullets all through her car killed her. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and I, I mean, what do you say? I mean, I, I, there's, there's really nothing to say about that. Uh, I, I don't know if that was because she was black. I don't know if that's just because they were startled. I don't know in, in what realm it was. Um, I know the, the neighborhood and I, and I know, you know, kind of her background and stuff like that. But, you know, it's, it's tough to transition out of being the athlete. Mm -hmm. One, mentally in yourself, uh, there's a tough transition once you stop playing. Mm -hmm. And I would assume kids in high school experience it going into college. But it's tough. It's depressing. You, you, there's a whole bunch of mental and social and things you have to go through in order to get to the other side. And some of us, it takes life. And some of us, it takes 10 years. And some of us, it takes, you know, 30 minutes. Um, it's really about the energy you put into it. But, you know, fighting, fighting, being labeled an athlete, I just kind of embrace it. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I that, that is who I was. And I, I constantly tell people when they say, oh, man, you were the best this and that. And I just, that was, that was 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. That was 30 years ago. I mean, I still tell stories that, to our team and stuff about that, not to be like, ooh, I did this, but just because it's, it's a way to relate with what they're going through. But I, I literally, when people bring up stuff like that, I, that was 20 years ago. If I tried to do it now, if I was that age now, I, I don't know if I could play at Washington State. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the game is, is way different, you know. So I, I, just, I just embrace it. I, I embrace it as, I, yes, I was an athlete, but I, I'm, I'm more than that now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still in the athletic realm, which, you know, still, I mean, he played. Yeah. You know, so I, – and I, and I just embrace it. I don't take any ill will towards it. I understand – you know, that at one point I, I did something that was pretty unique. Mm -hmm. Now I'm trying to do something that's pretty unique to help kids be able to get that opportunity to do what I did, if not better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, I forgot to mention you as the head coach at Kentwood when I introduced you. Um, oh, no, it's all right. And, and that's, you know, I, I, I met you, I think, probably first when you were an assistant at Bothell uh, yes. coming up to our passing tournament. And, uh, yes. you know, he was there. Uh, Mike was there when they won a state title, and then he, since 2015, I believe, is when you, yep. you took on the job at Kentwood. So, um, 2015. Yeah, so that's our connection. And yep. uh, I know a year or two ago, our team got to play you in seven-on-seven, seven and, and uh, just the, um, the way your guys competed, and you can tell they played with a lot of respect for you and for the game. Yep. And, and so just seeing you up close there, what a good jo job you've done there. Um, what have you ever thought when you were, you know, going to 10 days as a freshman or sophomore that you would be a, a teacher? <laughs> Ooh. Um, I, I, I literally, so I've had, I have back all the way when I was 
one through 14, so many younger cousins. Mm-hmm. And I gravitated towards our, my younger cousins. I, I was always, there was a gap between my brother and my older cousins. And then I was kind of the only one, maybe two of us, uh, my cousin Johnny, we were in that same little realm, my cousin Latoya. And I always spent most of my time with the younger ones mm-hmm. and, and working with them and just, you know, having fun, playing. We'd go somewhere, we'd have parties where 100 family members would be over there. I'd be the guy in with the younger kids, like just, you know, having a blast, throwing them up in the air, whether we were at pool, throwing them into the water, just having fun. I, I went, you know, on racetrack days, days I wasn't racing. I would go over to one of my cousin's house and, and watch the kids and we'd go swimming and do all kinds of things. I, I was that guy. So I, I always wanted to do something with kids. Mm. Didn't know what that would be, but I, I've always wanted to be able to help kids. And then transitioning through the phases I went through and the things that um, I feel like I have a unique ability to be able to relate to a ton of different areas, whether you're white with a, a million dollar, parents have millions, and whether you're black and you have absolutely no money, I feel like I've I've, I've been in parts of that. Mm-hmm. So um, that's, that, that started to happen to me when I started to go to Mercersburg Academy and then being around this teacher that uh, just instilled to me a lot of different things that I just changed some of my values. Mm-hmm. Um, even in college, I was like, I don't know if I'm, I'm going to play in the NFL. I'm mm-hmm. going, or really it was basketball at that time. You know, so I never really thought about it. And I never really was told that you needed to think about it. Mm-hmm. It was just like, oh, that's Mike Bush. He plays basketball. He does this, you know, kind of that athlete thing. And which is kind of disappointing looking at it, but it just was my life. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, so it wasn't until really after, and I went and uh, became a paraeducator at Lakeview Elementary, and a lady by the name of Terry Stotesbury. She has so much passion for kids. She, she texts me every morning with Bible verses mm. still to this day. Mm. And that was probably whew, 15, 20 years ago. Wow. Um, and such an amazing lady. And it, 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 that kind of started to push me down that road. And then going to Bothell and uh, working with Coach Boehner um, and just seeing his effect and his, his presence with the kids and then building my own little presence with our wide receivers mm-hmm. um, and kind of mentoring them through things and working with them through things. Just, I, I knew that that was something that I wanted to do long-term and I want to just help and provide and what better place than to do it where I feel like gave me that next step in Kent. Yeah. Awesome. What uh, you, you touched on going to Europe. Um, can you relate um, maybe what you saw in how people address race in Europe as opposed to what you've uh, experienced in America? Uh, so I went, it's where I went, it was a melting pot. Um, I went to Luxembourg, Luxembourg. So in Luxembourg, uh, as at a young age, their kids start to speak English, German, French, Luxembourgish. I mean, it's right in between. Uh, the way I was explained it is it's, I can drive east to west in about 45 minutes, north to south in about an hour. So it's really small. But you got France, you got Belgium, you got uh, Germany all, and they used to conquer Luxembourg. Mm-hmm. But at one point, each one of them took over this country. Um, and so the inner, the inner city where I live is like an old castle. And I mean, when you want to go see culture and things like that, I mean, Obviously, I've, I've been in D.C. and did those types of things, but culture back in Europe is it's old. Mm. It's old. It's old, and it's beautiful, and it's things that you – it kind of just, once again, opens your mind to a lot of different things. But it's – I feel like in where I was, and, I, and my experience is it has to be different because I was playing basketball at the time. And when you're playing basketball there, everybody looks at you I'm like you're like, whoo, he's making millions when you're making pennies. Um, and you feel like, you know, but the people and the way they accepted me um, was, was pretty similar to, um, to here, but it just wasn't as like, boom, 
It wasn't as in your face like you're African American. And and really, I wasn't African American there. I was American. Right. <laughs> um, so um, you know, when you're talking about African American or African in uh Luxembourg, you're thinking of French uh Africans there who, you know, big population there, and that's what you're looking at. So I kind of stood out. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I was welcomed and, and, you know, it took some getting used to. I brought my grandma over there and she was kind of like taken back because we would go eat at a fondue restaurant and they would have dogs walking through the restaurant. And you're like, oh, (laughs) my grandma was, she wasn't, she wasn't having that one. She was like, okay, we got to go somewhere else. But, you know, I really, I really feel like back there it's a little more open, but then you read stuff. And that's my experience. Then you read stuff and you're like, okay, they don't, I wouldn't go today. Mm. I wouldn't go today. I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go. And I, I had some opportunities after there to go to Argentina mm-hmm. to play basketball. Um, and I, uh, I, my stepdad, um, who came into my life around 16, probably 15, 16, 17, um, he's Mexican American. Mm-hmm. So um, his family is from Mexico City, and he uh, implored me not to go play basketball in Argentina. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I ended up coming here and playing here for a little bit. But, I mean, I feel like it's kind of, in my experience, it's not as, like, black, white, because, I mean, there's there's 50 different – German, France, I mean, mm-hmm. in the same area, you know, Luxembourg is Belgium, you know, I mean, so there's so it's like a melting pot in where I was, right? right. And you told when you when I go and visit other places, you go France is French. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's my, my basketball coach was French. And when they say French are, whoo, <laughs> they're, they are, they're a different group. Mm-hmm. But I mean, is that is me saying that, is that being racist or, I mean, but, you know, it, it, amazing people. They accepted me there. It was a good experience. I actually uh, took my daughter with me. So they were able to experience that. She was just born in 2003. I went there in 2004. Um, so um, I had a little different. I didn't really go do the nightlife there. It was more, you know, family and playing and trying to enjoy that phase of my life. Yeah, I think it's interesting you say, oh, was that, you know, racist of me to say that? And I think um, at times, like, it's okay to acknowledge culture, I would think, yeah. right? Like, people have differences, and you're going to notice those. Um, but uh, uh, would you talk about what um, maybe, do you think that our country has gotten better? Uh, you know, obviously, you know, slavery's been gone. Uh, the civil rights movement, you know, has happened. And, you know, we've had an African-American president yet we see the rioting and things. Is there stuff that was just below the surface that's, that's rising up now? What's going on? Or have we gotten better? So my view is maybe a little controversial. Okay. I feel like we've gotten better. Mm. I, I personally, as a country, feel like we've gotten better. Obviously, it could be better. Gap could be closed between African American and what we get and the things that we are afforded and the opportunities that we are pushed in and the avenues um, within our cities. I think part of our is, is our city's problem. Mm. They, they need to start pushing our kids to reach this level. When I went to Mercersburg, this was the bar. Mm. Either you get there or you get there. Mm. And when you have a bar in which I've learned uh, through coaching that most people are going to push to get to that bar. Mm. You set that bar down here. That's where they're going to go. There'll be some that spike up, but you have to set a bar that is almost unattainable Mm -hmm. so that they fight to get to that bar. And I think that is the difference in my experience of the areas. Now, is there, is there things that go on in the world that are unfair and unjust? Yeah. I was chased home as a 12 year old from uh, school by KKK. Mm -hmm. I uh, chased home me and my buddy and the next day, my brothers went and found them and beat them up, jumped them, got on them, whatever. But I, I was chased home. Mm. I mean, that and, and 
anybody knows the area I grew up in, uh, there's Riverside, Rialto, and then there's Fontana. And I think at one point, Fontana was the capital of KKK, mm. uh, are, are really high in that uh, realm. So, um, yes, I, I, I think that we have moved past. There's a lot more to do, but also I think it's how you look at it. I think that right now in our world, most older black people or African Americans understand that there is that sense of racism and we have lived it. Do I think it's gonna change in my lifetime? No, I don't think so. I think it's already set in stone the life that I'm gonna have to fight through and live. Hopefully it will for my multiracial kids. Um, but I also think that it's almost right now, it's so heightened because I feel like white people are now deciding that they understand. Mm -hmm. So they're going through what we fought for so long ago mm -hmm. and are still fighting for. It's not over, I understand that. But I feel like the other side of the coin, they are now understanding and deciding that, okay, you know, this is, this is, this is worth fighting for. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, and, and it takes time. It's not like they were, oh, back then they were closing their eyes and they were blinded to it, but it's now in the forefront. It was, it was a prime opportunity between where we are in the country and where we are in the world that this is now created because it's happened before. Mm -hmm. I, I lived through the Rodney Kings down in Southern California and, and it's, you know, I, I, I get it. I get it. I just feel like, the other side are starting to now take that fight. And they are starting where my ancestors fought and walked and John Lewis walking across the bridge and all that stuff back then. And now they are picking up that fight to fight and we're joining. Mm -hmm. my, my concern, and I, <laughs> I don't want to go too far down this road, but my concern is when, in Seattle. So, you know, I... I I was encouraged to go and get out there and be out there and march and do those things as a black man, as a, as a coach and a leader of young men. And I chose to do it with in-house mm -hmm. because I feel like in Seattle and the melting pot that Seattle is and the culture of Seattle, I feel like the people, some of the people, not all, some of the people that are out there uh, marching, are gonna do that whether it's killing whales, mm -hmm. whether it's I mean there's so many things that and they'll they'll be out there next week marching for you know the planetarium. You mm -hmm. know, I mean they'll be out there the following week marching for the I, I didn't feel as I guess connected with mm -hmm. that. Yeah, that's um, um, because I feel like it's it's a it's a weekly thing for some people. So um, and that's that's kind of where I'm at in it. And I and I and I, I didn't go march. I didn't go protest. Doesn't mean that I'm not protesting here within my own house and, and working through the people that I'm surrounded with to help them take the next step in what we're doing and how we're doing it. I know the coach from Rainier Beach. Uh, he's been doing a lot behind the scenes to try to get things. And I'm, I'm, I tell him all the time, Hey man, whatever you're going to do, I, I, I want to be a part of it. I want to help. Uh, we've actually had, he's had four kids killed uh, in the last six months. And I've had two kids killed in the last, we have one together uh, that I'm going to a funeral on Friday. Um, Jamez Johnson. Um, and he was killed in some gang violence. Uh, um, and he was, he, uh, he was just a special kid. And I, I don't want to get teared up about some of the kids that I lost um, this past six months. But, you know, all of that stuff, all of that stuff is leading us to where we are when you're seeing the rioting. Um, you know, and I, and I don't condone the rioting. Get out there and protest. Do you speak um, and, and try to lead, but have some sort of substance behind it that's other than just rage against the machine. Mm. Because you know, that's, that, that's an area where uh, I connect with you on that, where um, if I could go out and, and hold signs that say Black Lives Matter, BLM, whatever, and go hold them up and, and know that I'm just 
standing with my black brothers. Yeah. I would be right there. But when it's connected with, you know, maybe anti-fascism and, you know, all the other things that get lumped in, I think it uh, can dilute the message. And uh, um, yeah, that's just, it's a complicated issue. So very complicated. Yeah, I, I would, I, I'm right there to say Black Lives Matter. And I 100% uh, believe in that statement and won't counter it with All Lives Matter, even though I believe All Lives Matter. Yes, for sure, but, we both do. Right, but it's because they have been undervalued, right? Because yeah. there has been attacks. And so I, I'll stand by that, yet I don't stand with the group, the yeah. official group behind Black Lives Matter, right? And I would say African American Lives Matter. Yes, yep. Yeah, I, I, there, there's, a, there's a ton of stuff that we could get into, but I'm an I'm a African-American Lives Matter. Doesn't yeah. discount the BLM movement, doesn't discount mm-hmm. anything of that, but I, I am coming from it from a totally different avenue. Right. And I, I think that, obviously, like you said, all lives matter, and I shouldn't be ridiculed by saying all lives matter. Right. Um, right. You know, my kids are going to be recognized as Black, they're half black, half Italian, mm-hmm. um, you know, but they're going to be recognized as black. And I get that. Mm-hmm. But I, I want more than burning stuff down. Mm-hmm. I want more for them than going out and protesting. Um, I, I want us to start helping change our inner cities. And that's why I think uh, the head coach over there at Rainier Beach, um, I think that's our inner city. Uh, KM, you could say, probably is a little closer to inner city nowadays. Um, when I went there, KM was like Kentwood is now, and it's transitioning. It's transitioning into multicultural, multi-diverse, socioeconomic statuses up and down. Um, and and we, with the new principal, Miss Kenover, uh, she's done a great job of helping us transition through that time and transition into having more African Americans in roles where we can help and she's been so supportive and she's all about the the person right not the black person not the white person not the girl not the guy not the you know lgbtq uh it's it's the person Mm -hmm. and and one of the things she always talks about in our meetings in our staff meetings is is an iceberg a lot of people see what's on top of the water but, but nobody really knows what's going on underneath. And that's something that really has connected me. When she first got there, I was a little, okay, I really like the last principal, assistant principal hired me, you know, but, but at, when you start to hear her talk and you start to be able to now going on year two, going on year three, you know, you start to understand that, okay, she, she, she is living what she's talking about. This isn't just like something she put in a PowerPoint mm-hmm. that she wants to, to say to us because the district said she needed to say it. This is something mm-hmm. that she really feels. Mm-hmm. So that's exciting yeah. Um, yeah. with understanding that, you know, Kent Meridian, where I went to school, is blending into Kentwood now. Mm-hmm. And back then, I, I would tell you some of those kids, you know, I, I went to Kentwood. I went there and played rugby. and wasn't it it is inviting as you know you might have seen thought but it's it's life it's what we go through it's something that we have to overcome and fight through is it right maybe not yeah. but i think, well, I think yeah. her authenticity living what you talk right like that's so yep. important uh, let me give you two last things and then um, yep. um so ideas you have to move our country forward or even just our local communities forward um and then what gives you the greatest hope? Um, but the, what gives me the greatest hope, I'll start with, is, is that it, it is being seen. Uh, it is at the forefront. Um, there is, I mean, there's not a lot of solutions being thrown out right now, but usually after the fires, and, and I don't mean that as go burn something down, but after the initial, you know, like, yeah, we're going to go out here, then people in academia start to understand and start to start to put things into place. And one of our biggest things is just not allowing, not allowing people that run the country to be able to dictate and us dictate the people. The people have to dictate where we're going and how we're getting there. The, the seeing multi uh, cultures out there and multi ethnicities out there 
pushing for racial justice lets me know that it's possible. Mm. Um, lets me know that, okay, that is something that's gonna happen long, probably after I'm gone, but understanding that we are headed in that direction. We are moving in the right direction instead of moving in reverse. Um, and one thing that I, I, I wanna do as a, as a person and as a coach and as a black male is, is tell more of my story. It's really, it's really the only reason why I, I got on this call. Um, one, because uh, I respect you and I respect the things that you have done um, and are trying to do. Um, but two, just, just to, to kind of make myself vulnerable. And I think if more people make themselves vulnerable, more people will be able to accept and know kind of the different cultures. I think we're all so guarded that when I go into, even into my wife's uh, in-laws, mm -hmm. I'm quiet. I, I don't talk. I don't. I don't really interact, and they take it as you know, angry. Mm -hmm. And I'm not angry. I just. I, I'm so guarded with my feelings that if I express my feelings and you try to use them against me, it just kind of closes me off. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I used to work for uh, some academy um, where I've had people say, um, you know, oh man, he, he's acting a certain way around them, and then a certain way around them, and I, mm -hmm. I don't say anything. I don't respond, mm -hmm. but in that and that to me is the definition of you know that racism and just pushing not that you mean it that way mm -hmm. but yes around around other black males who i have one thing that i don't have in common with you mm -hmm. i can can open up and be a little bit more of myself mm -hmm. and then in different realms I, i've learned throughout life and throughout my phases that when you're in that you, your your behavior has to be a certain way and you have to act a certain way it's not me being fake it's just adapting to your surroundings and understanding what it means to be able to survive not everything has to go against it. i'm gonna i'm gonna sag my pants because you know I, that's just what i did in california no i'm gonna pull my pants up i'm gonna put a belt on i'm gonna tuck my shirt in. i'm gonna wear a collared shirt i'm gonna i'm gonna eat dinner with the prefect of the universe of the academy and i'm gonna be respectful i'm a yes sir no ma'am i mean all the way through it doesn't mean that i'm discounting where i came from mm -hmm. it just means that i understand where and when to have that part of me and all those are parts of me all those are parts of me but there are times when you can't just be crazy or can't just mm -hmm have fun you can't be in the middle of class while teachers teaching and i'm helping students and just be like yeah hey, you know you know that's just not a time for that no matter if that's me or not so that that really has irked me to this day and i haven't had a conversation with that person but um you know it just it just pushes you away from things like that and it's things like that that really kind of that is what I, I, I hope for people to understand that comments like that towards black males, because we do act a little different around certain places. If I go to a coach's conference, I'm gonna be a certain way. If I go to the principal's office, I'm gonna be a certain way. I mean, it's just, and I think that's everybody. Yeah. I think everybody is like that. When everybody wants to say, I'm just so genuine and I, this is how I am everywhere. Well, then you're not very smart. <laughs> because you can't be the same everywhere. It doesn't mean you're discounting who you are. It's just, it's just that is what you do. That is what people do. Okay. Now, whether you, what you're saying is the, is the same, I could say, hey, we're all here and created equal to in 10 different ways to mm -hmm. 10 different people. But if you want that to be heard, you need to say it in a certain way when you're around certain people. And exactly. that is that is what really has gets me kind of fired up with what what's going on and because that has always been a knock on african-american males is that is that part when you're so when you're successful and you're on here you well he has a tie on and he's a, he's not acting black and he's not well i mean what is acting black mm -hmm. what is it like like please explain it to me because if you want acting black for me to be sagging with my pants down with a do-rag hanging out of the back of my pants then there that's the problem mm -hmm. that's the problem
that that is an issue. So I I, I don't want to get too far down roads, but that that to me is is where my passion is because it's it's to me it's ignorant. Yeah, it's ignorant, flat out ignorant. And um, but that's 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 what my battle is, and that's where I hope that change happens um, in the immediate future. Um, but I, I do feel like we are headed in the right direction. Um, do I know what person is going to lead us into that? No, I don't. But I, I do want to be an active part in wherever we're going and how we're getting there. Awesome. And I, I appreciate your passion in, in your last answer. And you know, I was just thinking in my own mind, you know, well, what does it mean to act black? Like, if you ask somebody to answer that, how could they not think, uh, well, if I, like how racist is it, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. That answer, yeah. That answer is, is going to be a, a pretty tough one. Exactly. And I, and, you know, and then that, that, that kind of is what embodies what, what the racism and, and, you know, cubby holding someone into a certain, like, this is you, mm -hmm. this is how you should act. And, and that, you know, and, and, it, and, and the, the comment wasn't, in my eyes, mm -hmm. wasn't meant that way, mm -hmm. but it was definitely that way. Right. Yeah. Which is where our disconnect is across the world. Yeah. People say things and and they don't mean it that way, mm -hmm. but it's really how you perceive it and how you take it and how it affects you and your journey and where you've been. Yeah. That that could be a firecracker. Yeah. Well, that's, that's why the first word is listen. You know, I think people could not even realize it. And then to hear, oh my gosh, is that something I've done? And, and hopefully it affects change, right? And, and people yeah. act differently. So I'm going to give you the last word. Um, anything else that you wanted to touch on? Uh, and I'll let you close us out. Uh, no, nothing else. I mean, I, I really appreciate you having me on um, and giving me the opportunity to kind of, you know, throw some words out there and, and, and just kind of my journey and, and what I've been through and where I've been. Um, but but I, I do want people to understand that if you're always looking back, you're not moving forward. Hmm. You know, if you're, if you're always looking back, you're not moving forward. And, 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 and my goal and my plan is to move forward. Um, you know, after this, I, I've really grown distant from my family. Um, and, you know, hopefully um, with being able to, to do this with you, I, my, my goal is to share it with my family members, my mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of family members down in California, because mm -hmm. I, I have grown distant. Like, I don't call my grandma as much as I should. Um, and, it, and it all stems from hurt. Mm -hmm. and, and it all stems from maybe me feeling like I'm not good enough for them. So uh, my, my hope in the immediate future is to, you know, be able to reconnect with more family members and just, you know, they used to go watch me play just like when I was young, watching my older cousins play. And somewhere along those lines, I, I've kind of shut everybody out. Hmm. And, you know, I just, so for me, that, that's kind of why, why I felt like really pushed to have this conversation with you. Um, and, and I really appreciate the opportunity and I, and I, you know, I appreciate you listening. Um, hopefully somebody learned something from this. Um, and, and I, and I love all, and I appreciate it. Yeah. I said, I guess give you the last word, but you sp spurred one more thing really quickly. <laughs> you mentioned even when you went away to your Academy that you'd see maybe a, a really rich white kid, but he's on drugs. And, and the thing behind that is usually the self-worth, right? Something's happened and there's just no self-worth. Yes. And, and that's the key that we matter, right? Yeah. Everybody matters Everybody. and we need to treat each other with love and respect and kindness. So Mike, it's been a total pleasure and I'd like to chat with you more sometime in the future. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.